Thanks for that. All right, welcome the three of you guys that are in this room right now. We appreciate it. And everybody online, I would love if you would share screen so that you are um, really going to be engaged, I guess is the best way to say that. Um, I do have handwritten cards here. I will come back down and collect what needs to be brought upstairs. Um, this is my friend, Brian Stone. Brian Stone, how long have you been with KW? Um, going on almost seven years. Seven years, seven years. And Brian was our productivity coach before I came in and really laid out a solid foundation for everybody in coaching. Um, and then has kind of really been pouring into his own team. Um, I'm not gonna speak out of turn here, but you do wanna be a, a bold coach, right? Maps coach. A maps coach, yes. maps coach. Um, somebody else wants to be a bold coach. Yes. So in order to be a bold coach, you've got to do some transactions, right? It's 75 for two years in a row. Yeah. So to just to get into the redshirt program for MAPS, you have to have two consecutive years of 75 units. So he so. is diligently working at that unit count right now so that he can live his life by design, which is to be a MAPS coach, um, which is basically anybody who is a big team leader or you know, above a certain production of what is it, seventy five thousand dollars in GCI? Seventy five thousand for breakthrough, which is um, uh, bi weekly calls, and so usually that's the introductory to maps coaching, and then uh, you have to be at one hundred and fifty GCI for your prior twelve months to go into mastery. Yes, yes, yeah. um, very, very cool stuff. Um, so that's what Brian's been up to, and he is very well versed on being a solo agent, being on a team and running a team. And he's got a lot to uh, share with you guys about when the seller today. So yesterday was by, so yesterday started off a new, a new grouping. So we're kind of reaching the end of our ropes here uh, and can't think of anybody better to explain it to you. So I'm gonna boogie out of here and let you take the floor and then I'll come back down um, and check in on everybody. Awesome. Could you do me a favor? Yes. Um, I had some stuff that was printing upstairs. I can bring it down for you. Yeah, you can bring it down. Yeah. Awesome. What's up, guys? How you doing? Doing well. All right. I'm going to ask that you guys move up and that you're in the first couple of tables. We have a small group. And I'm that kind of teacher. I apologize. And then uh, let's see. We've got Stephen, Tamara, Madeline, Don, um, H., uh, I don't know what H stands for. So all of you guys that are online, I'm going to ask that you have your screens on. You can keep yourself muted unless you want to talk. Um, but unless you have a specific reason that you cannot have your screen on uh, and uh, having a hat on doesn't count, having kids in the background or dogs in the background doesn't count, I'm going to ask that you guys be engaged. So um, awesome. Thank you, Madeline. Awesome. Amazing. Uh, the only reason I am put together is because I'm here. If I were zooming in, I would be uh, in, in just a uh, probably a white t-shirt and a hat and uh, and barely awake. So I get it. Uh, awesome. I see Sess online. Thank you, Sess. Sess, can you do me a favor? Um, will you go ahead and put a post on the internal page and let people know that Ignite when the seller is live and so that anybody that is in Ignite is still welcome to join and go ahead and repost to make sure that they, they know that they can still jump in. I'd rather them be late than not at all. I'll send an email too. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and we've got a bunch of handouts as well. So my requirement for you guys getting these, these handouts too is, is being engaged. So I want to make sure that you guys are, are actually participating. Awesome. Let's jump right in. Make sure that this is working still. Okay, it is. Awesome. So um, you guys have been through a lot, right? So you, you've actually you've actually gone through a lot of coursework. And I'm going to silence that. Um, so we are on session now 15. So um, out of you guys online, are you uh, you guys here? Or what percentage of the sessions, and you can toss it in chat or, or shout it out, what percent of the sessions out of 15 have you guys been to so far? I've missed two. Two? You've missed two? Missed two, but I've reviewed them in book. I've taken it at night before. I'm not trying to say it that way. You know, it's changed a lot, right? Ignite's changed a lot. There's sure. a lot more material in it, and uh, teachers are different, you know, compared to what we had a few years back. So awesome. So 13 out of 15, not bad. Yeah. Uh, not bad. And then you rewatch those numbers you guys. I missed two as well. Missed two? 15. So so you've gotten to all 15 or you've missed 15? 
I say you're here now. So if you're saying that you're going to miss 15, then I'm just like, are you walking out halfway through? I was trying to try to get a gauge of what's happened. Awesome. Um, how about you guys online? Uh, where are we at? Oh, and I've got chat. Oh, I can see chat. Awesome. So have you guys been able to see most of the sessions? I have missed one, but I reviewed it on YouTube. Awesome. Awesome. Um, is it is it Andrea? Did I pronounce that correct? How many sessions have you seen? You've seen yes, um, I missed one, but I also went back um, later and watched it on YouTube, which was really great. Awesome. So I have all of the people that are committed and still here. I love that. Ignite, it's always entertaining to me to see a bunch of people at the beginning. And then by the end of the sessions, um, there's maybe 20% uh, um, at best of the people that started. You know, it's interesting thing uh, thing about that is if you guys heard of the the eighty twenty principle, well, they talked about it in some of the other sessions. Okay. So, so who wants to tell, let me know what that is? Twenty percent of your work produces eighty percent of your outcome. So, twenty percent of your efforts produces eighty percent of your outcome. Correct. Um, put another way, uh, that's also true for people. So, twenty percent of the agents do eighty percent of the volume. Right. Um, twenty percent. Twenty percent of the people that actually attend Ignite. Uh, will actually put the items into practice and actually get something out of it, and the eighty percent won't. So, congratulations for you guys being part of the twenty percent, and you're on the last leg. So, um, out, out of the ones that you guys have done so far, I just want to hear from you. What's what's your what's your favorite session, or what's the thing that you've gotten that's really impacted your business already, or that you're excited to implement afterwards? They've all been good sessions. I think communication, the lead gen, time blocking, like. Follow up. There's a multitude of things. Awesome. Reaching out, making contact, like just talking one on one, awesome. face to face is big. Getting them in your database and qualifying them, asking them questions. So, so do we? Um, why why do people attend training? Do we go? Do, we, do we, why are you guys going to training? And you guys can shout out online too. Are you here for knowledge? Or are you here for tactics? Are you here for inspiration? Are you here because there's nothing else that you would rather do? I'm here to learn. Um, I am not quite fully licensed yet, so I'm trying to learn the ropes. Love it. Love that. Um, so I actually started my activities back when I got licensed well before uh, my license came back. And once I passed my test, I drove it up to Jeff City to get a temporary license so I could get started right away. Right. You so it, you drove it to Jeff City. I drove it to Jeff City. Yes. I should have done that. So so that the day that I that I passed uh, passed and was able to drive up there, I, I could start start getting into it and actually have real estate conversations, right? Instead of just conversations. But I, I love that, Madeline. So so are you having conversations? I know you're learning. Are you having conversations with people, letting them know about how excited you are about what's coming up? Um, not quite. Um, I'm trying to get up the confidence to get to that point. It's okay. more of a, a mental thing for me. So are you here for training and learning or are you here for your mindset? All the above. All the, okay. All right. Now we're doing it. Okay. Awesome. It was a trick question. So, um, well, I, I hope that you guys get, uh, some information that's, that's, um, tactics that you guys can actually put into play today. Cause we're going to talk all about the sellers. I love working with sellers. Um, as Shanna mentioned, I'm a prior coach. I am a team leader currently. Um, I've been on teams as buyer's agent. I've been in a business partnership. Um, I've been in just about every style of real estate uh, um, structure that you could imagine. So, um, and all of those things have one thing in common, and that is that you, if you don't have listings, you don't have a business. Period. Right. So, I'm actually really excited to teach the session because this is all about how to win the seller. Um, I first took this class in Kansas City. It was really great. It was an all-day class. I really love that they have some of the concepts that are here in Ignite. Um, so I um, hope you guys get some tactics that you can take away, and I also hope that we get some mindset uh, done too. But I'm big on expectations. So, and I don't have a whiteboard marker. Awesome. Hey! Yeah. Um, so we'll just, we'll, we'll, uh, right there, sir. I'm at thank that. you. A whole bowl full. Thank you. What was your name? Rob. Rob, thank you, Rob. Appreciate that. So um, I want to know expectations. So what are the expectations that you guys have for me? 
and for the class. You guys can shout them out. Uh, what all information you bring to a listing presentation. Okay, love that. All right. What to bring? I'll just put LA for listing appointment. Okay, that's a good one. What else? Trying to think of objections, like how do you handle certain objections, you know, at that appointment, you know, as far as trying to get that listing. Your goal is to go in and get the listing, but if an objection or two comes up, how do you handle those? Is your goal to get the listing? Yes, every time. It is. Well, yes, sir. Okay. It is. It should be. We might dig into that a little bit later, but I want you to hang on to that one. I won't, I won't, I won't uh, contradict you right now. But what else? Other expectations? What all information do you want from them? Like, okay. What? So, so what do we need from the seller? So, is that uh, are you talking about like uh, like questions to ask? The seller, just or, I mean, like you personally, like what are what are some of the things that like you go over that's like not necessarily like you have to know it to list it, but like 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 for instance, one thing like we started doing is like in our little listing presentation, we'll do like ten things you love about your house, and like they might bring up something we could like gotcha use or we that we do you know use as maybe. <coughs> So unique item of value. Is that what I hear you saying? Yeah, cool. So so what's something that's that's creative and new and, and awesome that, that you can do this other people aren't doing? I guess so, yes. Yeah, so. Cool. All right, all right. Is that kind of articulate? Okay, cool. Anybody online, anything in the chat you guys want to want to toss in or 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 uh, add to? When you do a CMA, do you do it prior to that appointment or yeah, so, refer, it depends on how the appointment goes, I guess. That's a really good question, Rob. I'm actually glad you asked that. We're going to get into that a little bit in terms of um, my systems and how I prep for an appointment, um, but we'll we'll absolutely address that. So yeah, we'll just say I'll just put CMA in general. Now, up to this point, you guys have not dug in and done any any particular CMAs, right? So you no. actually haven't haven't done. No. Uh, I've done the property itself in the right. past, but, but not, not in, in this course. course. Cool. Okay. No. Awesome. All right. Uh, last chance. We can. Have, I I got room for five. I got four things. Expectations for me or for the class today? I would say um, just like getting to know that person or let's say you're in an open house and somebody comes in like getting that connection with that person so i guess like building a relationship okay. like what kind of conversations you have or how do you cross that bridge of when somebody doesn't really want to share their stuff so you're talking about lead conversion yeah you're talking about actually converting just a conversation into a future client that could potentially yes. be a future list. Exactly. Did I, <laughs> yeah. did that articulate right? Okay. And Nicole. Nicole. Thank you. Um, I really was going to be embarrassed if I said that wrong stuff last year, right? Because I met <laughs> yeah, you like you three or four times. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Uh -huh. Great. So what we're going to cover today. So we're going to we're going to talk about a sellers. How do I identify what an a seller is? We're talking about getting the appointment, which is going to be addressing some of the lead conversion there, right? Um, uh, Pre-listing uh, appointments, uh, the agreement, uh, and then we're going to do a recap and, and actually get into some some, uh, some daily systems for success that you guys do at the end of every session, right? Where you actually go in and you start doing the activities that we want you to do. So, all right. So this actually starts from a quote from uh, the Gary Keller himself. While leads are vital to your sales business, seller listings are critical to your ability to build it to its highest level with the lowest cost and highest net. So does anybody want to give me um, some thoughts around why Gary Keller, the uh, founder of our company um, and writer of the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book, um, would say this? Well, you need listings. It's like inventory on the shelf, but... If they're not priced at a fair market value where they're going to sell and not sit there, realistically, if they're priced properly, they're going to sell fairly quickly too. Sure. So that has to do with the process of listing itself. But why do you think he would say that they're critical to your ability to build it to its highest level?
with the lowest cost and the highest net. Because by getting listings, you're also potentially getting buyers or meeting buyers. Or Bingo, meeting yeah. Buyers. What was your name? Uh, G. G. Awesome. So G, G hit it. Uh, I was going to say that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you got to do it first. No, it's so, okay. I, yeah. Okay. And, and you know, the great thing about uh, learning is it doesn't matter who says it first as long as somebody says it. That's right. That's what Einstein said, too. So um, so the highest level, lowest cost, highest net. Um, is the purpose of business to have volume or is the purpose for profit? Profit. Profit. It can be different, by the way, depending on who you are. But for most people, it's profit, right? If you're not making enough money to uh, live your own life by design, does it matter how much? you do in terms of volume or how many how many homes you sell. No, it's about the net, right? You should always be leading the profit and listings allow you to do that. So yes, they net you one buyer on average, potentially more, um, but also they are more profitable. So why are they more profitable? Because you're not driving around, spending money on gas, showing people houses. Okay, so, so you're saying buyers take longer to work than sellers? And they actually cost money too. Yeah, okay, Good. tell me more. Oh, with recent clients, I've driven an hour and a half and then another hour and another hour and then another week and another week and the same thing. And it adds up. So you're spending a lot more on that than you would, you know, just driving the house once or however many times you do listing it. You don't have to go show that person around the whole state. Sure, sure. Well, and I would argue that um, if you guys are putting in some of the principles that you'll learn as far as uh, working with buyers, and you could probably avoid a lot of that, right? But not all of it, even, even properly leveraged, even with proper expectations, buyers typically take more hours, not necessarily longer to close, but more hours than a listing does. Um, because um, a lot of it is licensed work versus unlicensed work, right? So you'll get to a point where you can actually leverage a lot of the listing activities out to people that are non-licensed or other vendors, right? You don't have to go take the photos and get that prep done, right? You can have somebody go clean the house. You can have all kinds of different service providers to, to, to benefit your seller and to prep the listing. And you are not have to actually, having to actually physically do that, right? Um, even input, listing input. Um, uh, is oftentimes a large percentage of it, not all, but a large percentage of it done, uh, is able to be done by non-licensed personnel, right? Non-licensed individuals. So um, that that means your profit's higher. Um, can you set your price when you're on the buy side? In terms of your price, your commission, can you set how much commission you make? No? Not really. Yes and no, right? So yes, the employment agreement, you can actually dictate, say, hey, this is the agreement, you're gonna pay me X percentage and then this transaction fee, if any. And then uh, as a listing agent, you get to dictate what compensation is for both sides, correct? So if, if I'm a listing agent and I have control of the listings, let's say I had 90% of the listings in this market, hypothetically, I don't, would love to, hypothetically. Mm -hmm. And I decide that buyer's agents are paid too much and I wanna actually put the buyer's agent compensation that I'm gonna offer for all, all of my listings down to one and a half percent. What can you do with that as a buyer's agent? Realistically, you can argue for it, right? You can ask for that compensation from your buyer, which sometimes they can do and sometimes they can't but you really don't have control to dictate what the seller does. You can try to negotiate for it. And I'm, I know I'm going like way extreme, way, way in the beginning, but I, I cannot express enough how important it is that uh, you have listings because the ones that have listings control the market, period. You control where homes are priced, where they start, how they're marketed, how they look, feel, and you control the compensation of your other agents indirectly. Right, and that's a scary place to be. I actually saw that happen when the market got really hot. It calmed down, thankfully. Now we see most listings listed with 3% as the offered compensation for buyer's agents that bring a buyer to the listing. But there was a time a couple of years ago um, where the market was just getting really hot and listings were absolutely everything that um, a lot of listing agents were choosing because it was, uh, you know, they could. And the listings uh, inventory was so low to, to offer 2.5%. Or 2%. So um, you control your net instead of somebody else's. 
that make sense? Is that sticking with you guys? Had you guys ever thought about it from that perspective? No. It's a little scary, right? When you think about it, you do not want to be in a world where you only are a buyer's agent and and you're not at least coordinating with um, an office or a team or a business partner that is focused on the listing site. You you have to have listings. Awesome. So let's get into qualifying. Sorry to go like doom and gloom there uh, right off the bat. So um, A, so A means able, ready, and willing to do business within the next 14 days. So those of you that, that are taking notes, you should be uh, writing that down if it's not already there in front of you in your participants guide. So A, um, how many A sellers do you guys have um, in your pipeline really dictate what your business looks like for the next, uh, the next quarter, right? Um, cause a means business now, right? So we can actually expect to transact. And so, um, do we, do we want everybody to be a absolutely right. <laughs> uh, eventually, right. We want to, we want to work them up to it, but, but this is, this is just a starting point. And, um, when you're actually, you know, looking at that, it means they're financially able to complete a transaction now. And they're motivated to make strategic decisions now. And, and this can um, this can get tricky because a lot of a lot of uh, agents think that they're uh, ready and they're able, so they're an A, but they're not willing, right? The motivation isn't in line. So when we start getting into conversations to have, right, what questions to ask, lead conversion, um, your you know what what to actually say, handling objections, all that stuff in a listing appointment. A lot of what you're going to be going into, what I'll be going into with you guys, is how to identify motivation, because um, motivation is where uh, you find your A sellers, right, and A buyers, right. It's not it's not just about um, um, they're 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 they have the equity, and them uh, being yeah, well yeah that price makes sense, right. Um, so we've already talked on this a lot. I talked about uh, listings, pretty hard leverage and leads. Obviously, these are the three things you had already mentioned it. Um, listings bring leads, right? Listings can also um, help with leverage because they're leveraging out your time. Again, they're taking less time, more net. So pretty, pretty basic. The virtues of the seller listing. I want you guys to shout out uh, someone to read number one, two, and three. Seller listings mean marketing opportunities. You have more control of your time. Seller listings maximize your per hour compensation. Awesome. So all the stuff we just we just covered, right? So awesome. I'm way ahead of myself uh, on the slides already. Uh, let's hear four, five, and six. How many different? Volume, volume, volume. With seller listings, you're on the front end. The pricing, properly marketed seller listings, bring you more business. Awesome. Yeah. So again, more of what we were talking about. Thank you. Um, but again, properly marketed seller listings property market. Um, so that, that has to do with price and also has to do with how you present a listing, right? Um, and we'll get into that too. So there, uh, have you guys seen this cycle before on the buy side? You should have seen it like a buy side cycle, looks similar, right? There's also this, this seven step seller service cycle as well. And it all really starts with lead conversion, which is uh, what you had brought up, Nicole. So I uh, so love that you had that. And then we've got pre-listing, listing consult, Servicing and marketing, offers and negotiations, contract to close, post-close systems. So that full cycle. And I want to talk about this at the very end. So you guys make sure that we're talking about post-close system because this is the thing that is easiest to miss. Um, us as agents, because we're very lead generation minded um, and we're doing those activities, oftentimes we, we miss out on the lead follow-up um, or we make assumptions on the quality of our database once they close. Because we assume once they close, hey, um, well, they're not going to buy another house again. So I just need to focus my time on getting new business. And I can tell you that that is absolutely not the case. I have had clients that I've helped purchase and then within six months have turned around and become listings for me. So you really can't ignore, ignore your post-close systems because life changes can happen um, very quickly. And people don't always move in that typical three to five year time span that we expect, right? Awesome. So a lot of stuff in a short amount of time. Any takeaways from that first, first couple of minutes before we move on to some of the details? Listing agents can control the market. Listing agents control the market. Love it. Love it. What else? Any, any other takeaways? Are you guys online? I don't see any chat.
I'm going to have to have here at least like two more takeaways from the first part. I just never thought about how sellers control the market like that. And that if you're a buyer, then you're really, you can't do anything except negotiate for that. Yeah. You're at the mercy of the market. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. One more. Actually, same with me. I've never heard that before. How by having sellers, like you can actually control the market. I've never seen it from that perspective. Start looking. If you guys are actually are look, looking at, uh, at listings when you're reviewing a hot sheet, right? Actually look at the compensation scroll on the bottom and look and, and see if, it, if it's ever different. You'd be surprised how often that actually happens. I just assume that it will be always 3%, but I've never actually considered that. That may be the commitment that the buyer is making with you. Um, but there's a difference between signing a commitment that, yeah, you're good, I'll pay you the 3%, and having 3% to pay you, right? A lot of our buyers have that money saved up to use towards their down payment. So if you're in that situation where a listing agent is controlling that compensation and it's less than what you agreed to be paid by your buyer, then they may not be in a position to cover the difference, even though legally they've signed a contract that said they would, right? And, and your fiduciary responsibility gets in there too. So are you going to dictate which listings you show based on compensation? You're not supposed no. to. Legally, you can't. Legally, right? you can't. Shouldn't, right? It could it's, have some, you know, you look at one that's one and a half percent versus three percent, which ones are you going to show? Well, and I would say that... I'm not trying to say it that way. No, 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 no. And I, and, and I would say that, you know, when we get into seller conversations too, I'll coach my sellers on that too. Uh, when they start asking for there's going to be a lack of interest uh -huh. from a lot of potential buyers if you're only throwing a one and a half percent on that direction right yeah you're shooting the listing the foot yeah in a normal market in a normal market right but in a in a low inventory market maybe not right and your fiduciary responsibility whether you make five hundred thousand or five dollars on a home, if you sign a contract saying that you have a fiduciary responsibility to meet your client's interests, mm -hmm. you're going to show them that house, right. right? Regardless of your own personal compensation. You should. You should, right. And so and you can negotiate for that, but still, yeah, if you control listings, you control the market. So what if they don't have the money to pay you? Like, what do you do in that situation where that is your agreement that they pay you 3%, but then they don't have that? Is, do you just drop it just to keep the client for future business or do you that is an excellent question that only you in that situation can decide right because um you can either negotiate for it you can try and get it from listing agent or you can drop it to benefit the buyer um, or you can ask the buyer to to to, to, to make up the difference which if they can't then they won't yeah right so it's a sticky situation you want to avoid being in. Isn't that setting the expectation a little, I'm not saying high, but on the buyer when you're going to ask them if they can throw in the difference. When you're going over your buyer's consultation. On how much of a property. And, and you're talking through your, your paperwork, just be mindful about what they're actually signing and making sure that you guys are, 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 are talking about that. I won't get into the weeds with that, but if you guys have not been to multiple contract classes, over employment documents, you should go to them. Because mm -hmm. you're going to get a lot of information about how to present that in a way that they understand. Right. So that they understand that this is your commitment to this, even though, uh, yes, as a pass-through, technically you get to work for free, right? Mm -hmm. Because the seller's paying my commission. There is a caveat there, which is if it's up to the agreed upon commission. And so um, you can cover that with the client if you want to go to the weeds. Uh, but go to those contract classes and that'll, that'll dig in. Awesome. So let's talk about actually getting the appointment. So um, someone read the first two keys to converting your A sellers. Respond right away to leads inquiries, get valid and complete contact information, save it to command and create an opportunity. Love it. Love it. Uh, let's hear number three and four. Determine their motivation to sell so you can speak to it. Set an appointment, time, and date for as soon as possible and send a free listing packet. Love it. So I want, I want you guys to, to notice number three, right? So we talked about motivation. Um, is this at the appointment? Are we at the appointment yet? No. And we're already asking for motivation. Motivation is absolutely everything. You guys need to be making sure that you're asking those questions to get the motivation. So um, 
what are some motivational questions that you could ask? To, uh, what are some questions that we could ask to actually determine what the motivation is to sell? How soon do you need to move? How soon do you need to move? Okay. Why are you selling? Why are you selling? Okay. What else? Where are you moving to? Where are you moving to? That's a good one. Okay. There's a lot of caveats there too. Like they'd like to move, say they want to move in two months, depending on where they're moving to and in that neighborhood. What's well, a backup plan, right? Yeah. Like you put your house on the market and it sells. If they don't have something to go to, they need a backup plan or plan B, in my opinion. Yeah. It'd be kind of nice to know if make sure they're aware of that. So um so Cess is part of the console. I'm sorry. I no, it's know. okay. That's part of the console. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, but, but, yeah no. but but we're here, we're 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 even before the console. This is we haven't even set the appointment yet. We're asking right. about motivation, right? Right. Um, so, um, Sess, you're online right now too. Sess is my, uh, is my admin for my team. So she's, she's, uh, she's online and in, in, in the call as well. Um, does it give you the ability to share screen? If not, I may have to give you permission. So you may want to get, um, uh, the seller pipeline, the cultivate pipeline pulled up. Um, I don't need it just yet, but we'll put up in just a second. Sess, if you want to get that ready to go. Um, so yeah, determine the motivation. Um, what causes, you know, what causes people to sell? Downsizing. Yep. Job changes, locate, relocation for a job. Divorce. They lost a family member. Bad neighbors. <laughs> bad neighbors. Love it. <laughs> hey, I moved once because of bad neighbors. <laughs> I was surrounded by people cooking meth, man. I got the hell out of there. I went to let's see um we can we can go into the weeds but we'll keep it super simple this is the way that i've always um taught this with with my team with my coaching clients is it's plus or minus people or plus or minus money pretty much anything related to why they would sell is that right so you just need to find out what that is right so plus or minus people examples you already gave them uh divorce right Death in the family, birth, right? Uh, college kids are moving out. College kids are moving in. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, um, all different kinds of things that have to do with people. Aging grandparents now, or aging parents now, either one. Now we have to move them. Thus, okay, we're adding people, right? And so that sparks a move, right? Um, plus or minus money. So some examples of that. We talked about people. That's a big one, right? Plus or minus money. What are some examples? Of they got a raise and they want a bigger house. They got a new job. Yeah, new job, raise. Awesome. What else? Relocating. Relocation. Okay, for? For their job. Their for job's for relocating them somewhere else. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. So so relocation. It could be out of state or even mm -hmm. in town, right? What else? They for lost the job. Money effort. Cost of living is a big one, right? Hey, this neighborhood, this HOA is just eating us alive and they just did the special assessment. We don't like the HOA owner. They told us how our flowers need to be. We want to sell, right? Because well, that still would fall under that money up or down, right? Um, what else? Some other examples of um, some, some negative, right? Loss of job, right? You get laid off. Okay. That's a big one. Um, uh, our interest rates and changing, uh, changing, rates uh, impacting one of these categories. Now, that's your right. I wanna lower my payment. I wanna downsize. Even if they can't afford what they're in, they don't have any job changes, we still wanna lower our cost of living, right? Downsize that. So up or down people, up or down money, those are motivating factors. And if you ask questions around that, you're gonna to get to the motivating factors and you can do that over the phone. And so we can just do some quick role play. So Nicole, you're thinking about selling your house. And you can make up whatever scenario you want. I'm just going to ask you some questions. So we're actually, I'm, I'm big on actual live role play. Right? So, um, Nicole, I really appreciate you um, taking the time to chat with me on the phone today. Um, remind me again, why it is that, you, that, that you're selling? Yeah, so I lost my husband recently, and I am just looking to get a new place. I am so sorry for your loss. Um, so tell me more about why this is part of of uh, the puzzle. So you, you, are, you, are you just wanting to move away? Are you needing less space? 
I am needing to downsize and also I just want to get away from the house because it reminds me of my husband. Okay. I can understand that. Um, so what could I do um, as your agent um, to help you sell your house uh, and, and make the process easier? Yeah, so I would like to make um, $300,000 um, out of like my house so that I can downsize and have extra money uh, for me to invest. Okay, love that, love that. Uh, well, I definitely want to have a conversation about that in the future because I'd love to be a part of that um, and be support for you. Um, and um, I'm, I'm curious, is there any parts of the process that really give you um, a lot of concern? Um, not really. I just, I'm really ready to sell my house. Okay. Um, if I were to provide some services that would even help you with like the sale of some unwanted items, the cleaning of the house, um, the preparation of the house, would that be valuable to you? If yeah, I were able to talk course. to those when we met? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, I can definitely prepare for that. And then when we meet, if what I say makes sense, um, would you be prepared to go ahead and, and sign with me when we after we sit down so that we can get a timeline in place for you? Yeah, for sure. And I will also like to go over numbers with you and see your marketing strategy. Absolutely. I will bring those things so that we can cover all that in detail. Okay, great. Cool. All right. Awesome. Thank you. So what did I just get out of that motivational conversation? Definitely an appointment. Definitely an appointment, right? And I didn't actually go into setting the appointment. That was, you know, part of the, that was number four. I was really just hanging on number three for a long time. It was just number three. You found out her motivation, obviously. Yeah. Did I find some other items of value that would be unique to your number three that I could actually present to her? Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that I do, and, and this is just, this is not Ignite material. This is Brian material. So I take 7% listing. Not every time, because it's all based on that motivation. Because absent of value, price matters. If you provide enough value, you can be worth what you charge and you can charge what you want. If I was able to come into a situation like that, there's death in the family, which I've had clients like this that just don't even want to walk in the house. And I was able to facilitate the sale of the items with an estate company, the deep cleaning of the house, um, um, doing any small repairs, ahead of listing to make sure that you're not having to, to go and prep the house yourself, paying for a professional house cleaner. And, the, and on top of that, doing all of my professional marketing. Do you think people are willing to pay more for that? A hundred percent they will. Yeah. Yes. So the people, let's say they can't afford all those services you're going to have done for the, the, the sale, the house sales. Mm -hmm. Is that going to come out of the money when they close? So um, indirectly, it is when they, uh, so, so people that can't afford the services, that's really who that is for, right? Okay. Because it's coming out of the proceeds, not coming in their pocket. Because I've seen a lot of cases where people are old, they have no money, they need to sell their property to have money. Mm -hmm. and uh, So they can't do a listing prep, the property right? property needs massive cleanup before anybody in their right mind should list it, even though there's plenty of realtors that list it, and it's an absolute trash dump from hell. Yes, and, and they can't even give the damn thing away. I love that. I love that you brought. No, I'm up. serious. I I I looked at a property <laughs> like this just a couple of weeks ago. What was your name? Bart Phipps. Bart. Thank you. Uh, so Bart B A R T. Yep. First Rhymes with fart. Oh, got it. Got it. All right. Thanks, Bart, for bringing that up. Yeah. So. Um, you know, we talk about controlling uh, controlling the market, actually putting out well-marketed listings, right? That was what we talked about earlier. This is what I'm talking about, right? Um, are you solutions-based? Are you able to provide an already preset listing process that allows them to do what they need to do to get their home sold, right? There are agents across the country, NKW, that will pre-flip a home. They will have all the contractors lined up. And I don't do this because I don't have the... Uh, vendor infrastructure currently to do that, right? But there are agents that do this and say, hey, I, I could sell your house for this now, and then, or I could buy it right now and I could flip it. They're just honest. So, or if, if you wanna do this, then here's the company that we have that will provide the financing for you. And we take a percentage of it, by the way, right? And like, it's all good business, right? So you can provide anything that you want of value as long as it's within uh, within the, uh, uh, what you legally can do and it's providing value to the client. So, so my 7% listing example, right. With, uh, you know, Hey, husband pass, 
really just don't want to walk in the house and be clear of it. That's a great example. Also, someone that is, you know, equity rich and cash poor, right? Which is what Mark was talking about. That's a good scenario for them too. Hey, I can take care of all these things for you. By the way, I'm taking on the risk because if I don't sell your house, guess who's caught for paying for the cleaner and the junk removal and the, you know, and the, the, the fixes, right? So I'm on the hook for that. Um, and by the way, I'm so confident that I'm the right agent for you um, that I'm not concerned about that. And that's why I'm able to provide these solutions for you to make it easier. Right? Bring some bells. Awesome. So again, I, I, uh, not every listing is like that. It's very situational. I based on motivation, but I have a process to follow. Motivation also helps you to, to, to tell how to win the appointment. So what else did I learn from the, from the role play with Nicole on how to win the point? What else did you guys hear that I did? She needs 300,000. Okay, so she, yeah, she has a set number. So the numbers had to make sense. Okay, what else? Well, the fact that she might invest later on. So she might be, you know, your client now, but it's just a future client as well. Up or down money, right? That's a purchase to help her net worth. Yeah. Um, did I set the expectation not just to go to the appointment, but to actually take the list? Yeah. Absolutely. How did I do that? We asked her if she'd be ready to, once you presented, we should be ready to sign. She actually said yes. Yeah. She, I've committed, got to, she committed already over the phone. Yeah. I have a pre-commitment that if her motivation uh, is in line with where the market says her home is at, then I, I have the listing. Right. Would you guys feel a little bit better going into an appointment like that? Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. So all of this comes out in, in, in the conversion, right? And if you can't have those kinds of conversations, they're not a sellers. It doesn't mean ignore them, right? Put them in the pipeline. But that's not that's not who your focus um, um, is. Uh, or your focus should be on different things, right? It's not just about, um, hey, let's meet. Um, it's, it's hey, um, what are your goals? And how can we, we help work toward it? So... Um, Says, were you able to share screen at all? Yeah, hold on. Cool. Awesome. Can you guys see the screen up here? Cool. Can you guys see it online? Yes. Perfect. Thank you, Madeline. So um, this right here. So this is my uh, pipeline currently. Um, I am my listing and buyer pipeline. This is in command. And so um, we talk about a, a uh, sellers. If, if you'll click into, uh, let's click into the cultivate pipeline, says, if you would, on the listing side. So right now, nobody take my people. No. See how you'll write in the screenshot? Yeah, yeah. And, and this is recorded. So, so I'm, I'm, there's a lot of trust going out for any of you on YouTube, too. Make sure you don't talk to my people. <laughs> So uh, um, as you can see, I, I have A, B, C, D, and this is not default in command, but you can change your categories in your pipeline in command. And so I've done this so that I can really hone in on the quality and quantity of my pipeline. So I have it set even with a reminder. I've renamed this A seller, zero to 30 days. Now my system is not zero to 14, right? That's what we're talking about at night, mine zero to 30, right? So you can build your own systems. But if they're there, that's where they go. And if they're 31 to 60 days, they're B. If they're 61 to 90, they're C. And if they're 91 to 365, they're D. And if you notice, see these percentages? These actually contribute to your potential income because it has to do with conversions on the likelihood that they'll move from that step into an actual closing and a check, right? So we're going back out, Seth, and we'll look at the, the big pipeline. So you can see I have this, I can actually sort by my assignees if I want to too. And you can see all the potential income and probable income over here on the right-hand side by category. And so this relationship with your pipeline will allow you to sleep at night once you actually start doing the activities and treating your business like a business. I can promise you because I can look and say, hey, my probable income from my listing pipeline, which is lower than where I would like it to be as you guys can see, um, is 52.80. So that means from the percentages, that's the likely uh, capture, um, dollar amount capture from the, my potential income of 17.150, right? Now on the buy side, 
it looks a little different. I got 158,000 potential and 36 probable, right? So I've got a much stronger buyer pipeline right now than where my seller pipeline is. And a lot of that is as a result of selling listings last year and then getting leads from those. And now we're in a position. So I will tell you that it is a, it is a, a pendulum. You're constantly um, um, pushing up the listing side. And then if you do it right, the buyers will start to explode, right? And then you have to push back up the listing side and they, and, and they, and they explode. If you're ever just focusing too much on the buyer pipeline, you'll get so off-centered um, that it's really hard to counterbalance because you're going to be spending so much time working with buyers that you won't be able to prospect and really focus on your listing systems. Does that make sense? So that's why we talk about focusing almost exclusively on listings. And then uh, that way you can just continue your lead follow-up for any leads that are coming as a result. Does that make sense? So is that helpful to see the pipeline kind of view? I do the same thing for the buyer. So, and put it time-phased, guys, because if it's not time-phased, it's just kind of ethereal. Well, how's your business look this year? Yeah, you know, it's it's all right. I got a couple people. When are they going to transact? Well, probably, I hope, in the next month. You know what I mean? Is that, a, is, is that how a business owner talks? Absolutely not, right? So you guys have got to start thinking about how can I future-proof my business and really have a predictable income for this coming year? And this is how you do it. I don't even move people from the Cultivate Pipeline until we actually have them under contract or have the listing out. In the, in, the, in, the, in the sign is in the yard because this allows me the visibility to see where I'm at. And I could sort it by agent, right? So I can actually look at my team members and say, okay, who's, 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 who's uh, looking to meet their goals based on their pipeline. Does that make sense? Awesome. Cool. You can drop the, the screen share now. We'll go back to the slides. Awesome. Can you guys see the slides again now or do I have to reshare? I might've messed everything up. You guys will bear with me. Oh no, here it is. My videos, I want to full screen. Oh, here we go. Now I can share my screen again. Perfect, all right, are we back? Awesome, okay. Glad to know I figured that out, okay. All right, so what do sellers want more from their agent? So someone, uh, someone give me a couple observations from this because um, you know, getting to set the appointments about letting sellers know um, what you're going to be um, in terms of how business is going to be for them, but, but what, what do sellers actually want? So um, if you ask, they'll tell you, right, in the, in the case of the role play, but this is statistically from the profile of home buyers and sellers, which is a national association of realtors um, publication they put out every year. Really good data if you guys look at it. Um, this is from the one in 2021. Um, this is statistically speaking, these are actual buyers and sellers, what people want. And so the the, the highest percentage is other. <laughs> what does that tell you guys? Sometimes sellers don't know what they want, right? Or they don't know how to articulate it, or it's something that their realtor didn't ask for, right? Um, it's some other motivating factor. The second highest one, 21%, is to help price home competitively. And I like that they actually use that language. Uh, oh, no, excuse me, help, help sell their home within a specific time frame. I had that backwards. That's the 16%. So um, time frame, timing, timing, not money, timing. Uh, other than other is the top, top percentage. Um, what would you guys have guessed if you hadn't seen this chart? Would be the most important thing to sell. Mm -hmm. Money, right? Every agent myself included that you talk to, that's always their assumption when they're talking to, uh, to seller motivation is, well, yeah, they just, they want to make the most money, right? And that can get you in trouble because right here it's saying, yeah, that's 16% correct. That's not a high percentage. Out of 100 sellers that you talk to, only 16 of them are most concerned about money. Everyone else has something else. A lot of them, time frame. Um, Let's, let's look at some of that. helping sellers market their home to potential buyers. So 20% has to do with the marketing, right? Nicole did a really good job of actually scripting an, an actual conversation, right? That, that I probably would have had for a potential seller, which is say, I want to see your marketing plan. I want to know. But she said, it's about money and it's about marketing, right? Mm -hmm. And it's about time frame. So you had all three of those as a motivating factor, right? Um, um, but in the appointment, 
I'm going to be asking even more questions to figure out what's the what's the one priority, what's the what's the thing that you're most concerned with. What what are you what are you willing to cave on? Like, will you cave on money for time? Will you cave on time for money? Right. That all has to do with the conversation with the seller and with their motivations. So, uh, and then helping. Let's see, what was the yellow one? Yeah, time frame. Uh, helping sellers find a way to fix up home to sell it for more. Right. So, um, as you can see, so my my. Uh, VIP listing, right? My concierge listing, my 7%, I actually call it concierge, which is super cheesy, but it works. Uh, <laughs> um, that is geared to that specific problem. I created a solution for a problem that nationally sellers are saying that they have. I want someone to help me fix it up so I can get more money. That's what I want for my agent. And either you're the, you're the one that helps them do that or somebody else's. And sometimes the agent that gets the listing is the one that has the vendor network to allow sellers to be able to do what they need to do to get the most money. Right. So if you don't have a good relationship with your vendors, then this could be a weak point. Right. Does that make sense? Awesome. Are we getting some good stuff? You guys are like, yeah. <laughs> Tough crowd. All right. So building confidence and trust. Right. We, we can do that. Do you have a question? No, sorry. You just raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Building confidence. So, um, what are some ways that you can actually build confidence and trust with your client? Other than some of the stuff we've already talked about, what are some what are some ways to build trust? Ask the right questions. Be personal. Be personable. Asking the right questions. What are the right questions? I mean, sort of some up there, like especially if it's plus or minus people, you can kind of like build trust by building a relationship, and talking about things other than you know what your commission is going to be off the sale. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. What else? What are some other other ways? I'll say providing value to them. Okay. Uh, what has to happen first for you to provide value? Like, get a conversation with them or like have their information, have already, uh, like the, something built already. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, I'll give you a scenario. And I'm, I know I'm harping on this, I'm picking on you, Nicole. Um, this was an actual seller that. Um, I actually had the buy side. This was an actual seller, an actual transaction I had. So um, husband and wife, both terminally ill, um, both limited time to live. Wife's already moved out of state to work uh, through cancer treatments, specialized treatments for, for, for the disease. Husband's still stuck at, at, at home here in town, tightening up all the affairs so that he can go leave and be with her for the remaining time that they have left. Does he want to hear about your marketing? Is that an item of value? Yes. To somebody, Maybe. right? What's the, out, out of these, what's this? Time, 100%. These are actual people that sold in our market, by the way. It's an actual scenario. Do you think that they cared about what they made on their house? Did they care that you had the best marketing? Who's the agent that they probably went with? Mm -hmm. To make sure everything was done in a timely manner and get them their household. Whoever moved the fastest. Yeah. 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 So, um, in order to provide value, because you're correct, you have to ask the questions to know which value they value. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you tailor that experience to the individual. It's one to one marketing. So, what else? I think that. When you tell them that you're going to do something and give them like a time frame that you make sure that you get it done, what you say you're going to do in that amount of time that you're going to do, that way they trust you. Mm -hmm. They know that you are going to do what you say you're going to do. That's everything. Mm -hmm. um, anybody here know um, Ron Steffes? Did you guys, did you guys, so you had the opportunity to meet Ron when he's still with us? Yeah, I did. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Ron, Ron actually helped me. Uh, come on board. He was the first conversation that I had here at KW. He's a great guy to talk to. Super, super great guy. Um, we, after his passing, we dedicated the fly roll up, up front of our office for him. Right? He said something in my first bold session that has stuck with me forever. And it was really simple. He said, don't let your mouth overload your back. 
And I think that that's something that as agents, it's really easy to do. So what you're saying is don't promise more than you can deliver? 100%, 100%, yeah. So um, make sure that you guys are providing value, you're asking questions, and that you're only committing to things that you're committing to actually do, right? Because these people trust you. They're going through a life change. So, um, let me close. so before we get here, so I'm gonna go back uh, to your question at the very beginning. So I, I or, or your comment, I said, so what the, is the purpose of the listing to take the listing? And you said, yes. That's right, I did. You still believe that that's the case? That's my ultimate goal. That's your, that's your ultimate goal. That's my ultimate goal. Okay. Would anybody want to give a counter uh, uh, counter to that? What's the purpose of, of listing it for? Sell the house. To sell the house. Okay, same thing. Sell the house, take the listing. What else? We'll sell the house for them. For that way that they need it done. Okay. Still to sell the house? Yeah. Okay. I know what they value. I like that better. Now we're getting a little bit closer. Okay. Any any other any other thoughts? To find out what their motivation is. Find their motivation, yeah. So the, the focus during the process of building confidence and trust and setting the appointment and, and, and going through the process is not to sell. It's not to sell. Um, it, it, and that sounds counterintuitive because that's what we do. Um, but if that's where you start, then you're not going to be in a place of confidence and trust. Right. You have to you have to provide value. You have to meet the real estate needs that they have. You have to secure the appointment and you have to make sure that you know what their actual motivations are. Some of the best listing appointments I've had resulted in me not taking a listing or selling the house because it wasn't right for them, for their motivation. Once you understand the motivation, then you can be a real fiduciary. Right. Then you've actually earned the right to represent someone, which is not just representing them to sell a house. It's representing their real estate interest, which a lot of times means their financial interest. And sometimes that means they don't sell their house. So that's how you have to start. Hey, I'm here to help. Right. Um, and that also removes what a lot of people call in the industry commission brand. Right. Because if you're if you're really just there to just hammer to the appointment, um, some people where time is really important, they'll attract to that and you'll take that listing, right? And you'll sell you'll do great work. But some people, especially on the disc sale the scale, if they're more high I or high S, uh, that may be a total turn off. If you come to my house on a listing presentation or like a roofers come to my house and they start trying to upsell me and lead me to a counterfeit yes to get the appointment and to sell me something, you are so far lost before you even start. It's not even if you come to me and asking if there's a problem that you could help me solve and you give me solutions to do it, I will be loyal to you to the extent that I will send you my family and my friends. I have gotten a re referrals come from listing appointments that I did not take. Because if you know their motivation and you have the right conversation, then that's where the business follows. Does that make sense? So let's talk about actually uh, closing to the appointment. Though. Let's get into some tactics, right? So that was a lot of mindset stuff, a lot of motivational stuff. Can't tell I'm really passionate about people and not so much uh, units. That's, that's really where my focus is, uh, which is interesting because most of the agents that do a lot of units would tell you the same thing, right? Because that's where the units come from. Um, but how do we close? So seven things here. Show benefits, take back, negative, positive. Give them what they're looking for, the trial close, the assumptive, uh, the assumptive close and tie downs. I love closes. This is the, uh, this is the skills of real estate and we are coming into a shift yes or are we already here depends on who you ask right <laughs> so these these skills are what separates the 20 percent of the agents that do the majority of the business right versus everybody else so um showing the benefits we've already talked about right um that that's that's a lot a lot of uh what you can do pretty easily what is a take back close you might want to take a guess what a take back close is Okay, shift, the book shift. Who owns the book shift? Okay, cool. Get the book, it's $15. Um, and um, it, it, the office has it, they can charge it to your agent billing um, at, or, or uh, you can come borrow mine, right? But shift talks about all of these different closes. Um, so the take back close um, is 
is pretty uh, is pretty straightforward. Um, it's where you're 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 giving something, you're taking it back, right? And it, so, for example, it'd be like, you know what, um, Nicole, I don't I don't know if we're gonna I don't know if I'm the right agent for you or not, um, but I'd love to find out. You know, I, I might not be the best agent for you. That's a take back, right? Because they're expecting me to be like, hey, I'm the best agent. All the other agents suck. I'm I'm awesome. Hire me, right? The take back is if it's honest, I, I don't I don't know if I'm the right agent for you or not, right? This works on the buy side too. Like, you know what? I I, I really love working with home buyers, but I find that uh, I'm not the right the right agent for everybody, and that's okay. But I would love to sit down and figure out whether or not I'm a good fit. And then if we both decide that we like working together, then we can talk about these steps, right? That's a take back close. Does that make sense? Cool. So you guys can, if you, if you YouTube just closes, you can find all these closes and lots of examples of them. They're awesome. Uh, negative positive close. Anybody want to guess what the negative positive close is? This is my favorite, by the way. Take a guess. Online, you guys can toss in something in, in, in the chat. Oh, I missed your comment earlier about creating a relationship. Thank you, Andrew. Exactly right. So um, what's a negative positive close? Is something negative and in positive? No. Uh, no. <laughs> on, the, on, on the right. So, so what do most people expect you to lead them to? A yes or a no? A yes. So it's a positive. So negative positive close is where you make the negative response the response that you want. And there's lots of different ways to do this, right? So if you would typically lead somebody to a yes, a negative positive close leads them to a no, but it's still the answer that you want. The easiest way to do that is to ask a very simple question in front of anything that you ask them is, would you be offended if? Would you be offended if? And you guys that have notes, write that down. This is the best script I can give you. I use it over and over and over again. Would you be offended if? So let's, let's give an example. Would you be offended if I stopped by later on this week for about 15 minutes just to let you know what your home is worth? What's the, what's the answer that I'm leading them to? No. No. And is that the answer I want? Yes. Right? So, hey, would you be offended if I came by and told you what your house was worth? Well, well, no. So, great. When can I come by? I can come by on Wednesday in the evening at 5 o'clock, or if you're more of a morning person, I can swing by Thursday morning. Which one works best for you? By the way, that's, a, uh, that's an option close. That's not listed on here, but that's an option close. This or this? Not yes or no, this or this, this time or this time, right? So I actually had two closes in one. So a negative positive close. Somebody else give me a good example of a question you could start with, would you be offended if that'll lead you to a negative positive? Another common precursor is, would it, would it cause a problem if, you guys might have heard this too. Would it, would it, would it cause a problem? Would it, would it be a problem for you? Would it be an issue? And where this is used in, in a pre-listing conversation during a listing appointment, you know, it, it, would, it, would, it, uh, would it cause a problem for you if I was able to get the price that you wanted or over within 30 days? Would you have any issues with that, with moving on time? Right. And we wanted them to say, no, that's still a negative positive, but they may say yes. And that still allows us to explore more. It's like, well, why? So maybe speed is not their motivation. It makes sense. Would you be offended if I stayed in contact with you? I know that you said that you're not really in the market right now and you're wanting to fix up some things. Would you be offended if I called you about once a quarter just to check in and see if there's anything that you need update you on your value? No, that would be great. Awesome. What's the best uh, contact information for me to do that? I, I had that conversation yesterday. I was pre-qualifying some, some potential listings and they, they, they changed their mind from the time when I got the lead first in and when I reached out and actually made, made the, the connection to try and set an appointment. Um, it was, yeah, well, you know, the time is just not right. We're gonna fix our house up first. Again, fix our house up. It's one of the things that they need. Cool, do you need any support doing that? Well, no, my dad's a contractor. Awesome, do I know him? What's his name? I would love to have coffee, right? How can I get an appointment? Even if it's not with who I intended the appointment with, right? Still a negative positive. Would you be offended if I stayed in contact with you? Make sense? Cool. So while you're staying in contact with them, you're kind of coming up with a timeline too, though, really, as far as what your next step's going to be. Pipeline. Pipeline. If they're within a year, they're three within 365 days, they're deep. Right? So think of the deep pipeline. 
that's probably someone that if I don't know enough information, then it would probably need to be in a deep pipeline because it's potential that they would sell because they didn't really give me a time frame on when or how much they want to fix. So I'm going to continue to follow up and, until I get enough information to um, move them either up in the funnel or out you know, into a long-term nurture. But either way, I've had a two-way conversation. I've gotten their permission to reach out. So I'm going to do that. Right. So give them what they're looking for, right? Um, the role play was a good example of that. I actually asked what you were looking for as a seller. And so now I know before I walk in, this is what she's looking for. I'm going to have a seller's net sheet, which I'll pull up here in a second towards the end. I'm going to actually um, have uh, market dynamics, market analysis, right? I'm going to have all of that stuff there and ready to go. Um, trial close. Um, so trial close is, uh, is what I did actually earlier. You know, hey, if what I say makes sense, is there any reason why you wouldn't sign with me? All right, that's trial close. I'm testing the water and say, hey, would you close? And she said, yes. So I've already got the trial close, right? So that's, that's a trial close. I actually use that in the role play. Um, assumptive close. Assumptive close is, is pretty, pretty easy to guess. It's where you assume you already have the business, right? Um, that's when you change your language with some embedded commands, you know, things like when I sell your house, when you hire me as your agent, um, when we start the process, this is what it's going to look like, right? All of those kinds of comments, those are all assumptive closes. You're already operating under the assumptive that they have hired you. And you're leading them to that, right? Um, a lot of, lot of agents do really well with the assumptive close. Um, that one is only useful to me if it's sphere. If it's my sphere, which is the vast majority of my business, it's always an assumptive close, right? I'm gauging motivations, but I always assume I already have the business. Not, not without saying it, but by saying it. So I reinforce that I have it by having the assumptive close in the language. Like, hey, hey, really appreciate uh, you, you looking out. Yeah, you bought that house about three years from me. Uh, awesome. You know, um, you know, when we meet this week, um, what is it that you're looking for? What are your goals? Right. So I'm already, I'm already operating on the assumption that I've got their business and they're not going to meet with anybody. Else. Tie downs. So tie downs are really easy. They usually end. These are really good for teenagers. I have a 14 year old boy, um, and he has autism. So language is, uh, difficult for him. And we have a lot of arguments, uh, a lot of arguments. He's very direct with what he wants and tie downs are very effective. That sounds terrible because it's like, it sounds like I'm just tying down my 14 year old kid. That's not what a tie down is. A uh, tie down is, uh, wouldn't you think, isn't that right? Um, wouldn't you agree? Or just simply, right? All of those ending a sentence or a statement with those, those are all tie down closes, right? Well, you know, the market's changed, right? Well, we can't expect, you know, your home to go for the same price as the home down the street because you don't have the same upgrades as them, don't you think? Right? So I, I'm, I'm using the tie down to tie them into information and then I'm getting that confirmation. Well, yeah, or they'll object and then I'll handle the objection, right? As a, it, it, let's say in that example, yeah, well, the house down the street went for 300 grand. I don't know why mine won't sell for 320. Mine's bigger. Yeah, they have a complete remodel and you look, you have shag carpet, right? So there's there's a difference, right? So a tie down could could help me get there. But like, well, yeah, you know, it, we can't reasonably expect to sell for the same amount per square foot as a home that's updated uh, when your home isn't, isn't updated, wouldn't you think? And then they may object and say, well, I don't see why not, right? So they may, they may bully back and I may say, okay, um, help me understand what about your house leads you to believe that it's worth more than what the market dictates. And I would just have a really upfront conversation with them about market analytics. Okay. Are those helpful? You like those closes? Mm -hmm. Right. So, so we, we talked about one, two, three, four, five different types of closes. There's actually more than that. They're all in the shift book. You can also look at them online. I highly, highly recommend you guys check them out. Um, they're really, really beneficial. Um, hey, Dayton's on there. Uh, all right. Those of you guys that are jumping in, I love seeing some new faces. And I would love to see your actual faces, not just names. So if you guys are able to, uh, just cameras on so that way we can interact and you guys can participate. Um, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to make a comment or ask a question or uh, type it in the chat. So awesome. Isaiah, yes. what's up? Yeah, I'm seeing some people. Love it. Hey, how y'all doing? Yeah, this is... <laughs> 
Yeah, this is Dayton. Sorry, I'm uh, roaming around as I'm doing this with my phone in my pocket. So hard, sorry, a little hard for my video to be on right now. That is okay. As long as you are as engaged as you can be and you get to a place where you can, you can uh, uh, answer questions, you're good. Thanks, Dayton. Thank you. All right. So questions versus objections. So um, let's talk about this a little bit because one of the expectations that you guys had from the very beginning was handling objections, right? We talked about that a little bit in the role play with those, um, with those strategies as far as um, closing to appointment tactics, right? Um, but what are we, what, what's the actual difference here? So, we, so, so a seller may be asking a question, yet the agent hears an objection. And these are two different things and should be responded to differently. When a question is asked, you answer it, right? And when an objection comes up, you address it. And there's a difference. So um, what are some examples of questions that they might ask? And sometimes there it's a question and sometimes it's, it's an objection. Well, I won't take less than 300,000 from my house. Okay, so, is that, does that, so that's just a statement, right? That's a clear objection, so we handle it, right? Mm -hmm. We handle that objection. What's a question that could be a little tricky? Uh, what's a question they could ask where it could be information or, 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 or it could be an objection? Most of the time it's about it. The interest rate's terrible. Cool, great question. So that's a question, you know, aren't, aren't, aren't the interest rates terrible? What would you potentially hear as an agent? What's the objection there? What's the motivation behind them asking the question? Well, they don't want to buy because the interest rates are high. Right. So if you're just talking about how to how to market their listing, you just focus on a listing conversation and you run right past that question, you're not actually going to address the underlying motivation, right? So um, the best way to um, address one that you're not sure about is just to ask back, right? So ask that question one more time. Are the interest rates terrible? Uh, what do you consider a terrible interest rate? Four. Four? Okay. Um, so um, help me understand what about the interest rate um, has you concerned about selling your, your home? The house that I go to next. I should go to next. Okay, cool. Would it be beneficial if we start talking about that conversation before we 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 uh, figure out a plan as far as timeline for your for your listing? Definitely. Okay, cool. Yeah, you have to go somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. So that question led me into a different conversation. Uh, now, okay, I need a buyer's consultation. I'm not here for a listing appointment. I'm here for a buyer's appointment, right? And much much of, much of the time, they're the same way, right? You're going to arrive there, but I want to make sure that I'm addressing that. Okay. What's another question that, that could be a hidden objection? Somebody online can type one in or shout one out. It's a common question you guys might might hear. I know there's one that's like low hanging fruit that every agent is concerned about that always comes up. Is there a recession coming? Is there a recession? That's a good one, right? Is that is that a question or that you can answer or is it an objection that you have to address? What do you guys think? Have to address. Okay, so how would you address that? Find out what their motivation is. Okay. For buying or selling. Finding out the motivation for okay. So so coming back to motivation, right? Um, so you know, people buy buy and sell homes in recessions uh, and, and in good markets and bad markets and everything in between. Um, what about a, a recession um, has you concerned? I'm, I'm concerned that I'm going to lose my job and I won't be able to pay the house that I'm going to move into. Awesome. Great. So now we're getting into the motivation. I would tell you when I first started in the, in the, in the, uh, the business, I was really, really bad about being good at answering questions. I would just answer the questions and I would not hear the objections. I would not identify them or single them out. And I would leave a conversation feeling like I've got this business and then find out very quickly that I asked all the wrong things because it was more me answering the questions that I thought they were asking and and instead of digging a little deeper and understanding why they were asking the question. What's the objection with that? Does that make sense? This is, a, and this is just one slide is a very important part of today that I want you guys to take away. You're not just there to answer questions. You're there to handle their objections, to make them feel comfortable, to build trust and confidence right? That comes from two-way conversation, not just you being the best, right? 
Because if you ask me, oh, is it a recession? If an agent asks me that question, I'm going to go into a full class and be here for a couple hours. I'll tell you all the things that I think and all the observations I've made and that other people have made. And that's absolutely not what a seller wants to eat. It has nothing to do with them. It has something to do with them, right? Um, but you, you've got to you've got to really um, hear the question behind the question. Cool. Um, if they persist, um, you know, in 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 asking a lot of questions, and there's probably some signs there that they're not 100 percent confident using you yet. Um, let's talk about the commission question because nobody brought it up, so I'll, I'll bring it up. Uh, what's a question that an answer that that, that a that a uh, um, seller could ask about commission? Would you take less? Would you take yeah? Would you lower your commission? Right, that's a question. Is that a question that you answer, or is that an objection that you handle? Is that an objection that you handle? You think so? Yes. Okay. Because they're thinking what they can get for the lowest amount of money. Yeah. Right. So you can you can take it two ways. Some agents, and this is this is really great. Some 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 agents know that it's an objection, and they just answer the question, no, and then they just keep moving on, <laughs> which is an option. You can absolutely do that, right? And depending on how your your structure is set up, that 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 works for some agents. Um, I usually do handle. I usually do handle it, and saying um, so so what. Um, and I usually answer the answer it, and then I'll I'll uh, I'll handle it. Um, no, why do you ask? Right. So I'll say that. So yeah. So would you drop your commission? No. Why do you ask? Because Joe Blow said he would do it for a two percent or one percent less than what you're quoting me right now. Oh, okay. Um, so did he talk about price? No. Okay, so um, uh, what's what's two percent of nothing? Nothing, right? Nothing. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, so the question that you're asking is it about my compensation, or is it about what you walk away with? It's about what I walk away with. Okay. So that's. I just want to make sure I'm. If it's about my compensation, the answer is no. Yeah. If it's about what you walk away with, then I'd love to have a conversation. With it's you. About what I net. Okay, so 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 if what I'm hearing is it's really important for you to net. So what 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 number um, would you need to net for it to make sense to sell today? The two percent. Two. So you just need to net two percent. I can make you two percent. You you you're 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 setting a twenty percent equity. The two percent difference. That so so it's not you and him. Okay. So 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 is it safe for me to assume that you believe every agent gets the same results when they list a home? Do you believe that? Well, I don't know. I talked to Brian Stone. He seems to know what he's doing, but I'm not sure you do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I can understand that. So, so, so do you believe that uh, um, every agent is going to have the same results then? I guess not. Okay. No, I guess not. So then it's not about compensation. It's about results. And it's okay. about what you walk away with? Well, what I, what I net when I walk away. Cool. At so, closing. Okay, great. So, yeah. so, um, so let's do this. Let's let's you know. Uh, I'll talk to you about my marketing. I'll tell you how how I actually get get business done. Mm -hmm. How I net you more money than other agents. Right. We can go over a, an estimated net proceeds, so we can actually look at the numbers, and you can feel confident knowing what range uh, you might walk away with. And then from there, we can decide if it makes sense for you to sell or not. Okay. Does that sound fair? That sounds fair. Great. Yeah. So, again, you just address it directly. Yeah. Well, and along what he's saying, like you've got. Some companies that do like a flat fee, $3,500 fee. That's it. That's all they take. Great. Love that. Okay. What do you see? Yeah, so 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 remind me. So I'll address that. We'll just we'll, we'll say you're the seller. So so remind me again what you do uh, for work. What do I do for work? Um well I work in public safety. Public safety, okay, public safety. Um, so what's a typical caseload uh, as far as public safety? Like, do you have a certain number of calls that you process a day or a certain number of clients that you talk to? Um, yep. I'm on the phone all day long, um, all day long. taking calls and sending first responders out, that kind of thing. Okay. If we, if we upped your call volume by three times, would you be as efficient? Would everybody get taken care of in the same level? Probably not. Probably not. Okay. Because, mm -hmm. you know, essentially that's what that agent is doing. 
because in order for them to actually make a living, you see, they have to they have to sell three times as many homes as I do. And so, do you really think that that service is going to be the same? No. Okay. So, is it about my commission or my compensation, or is it about what you walk away with? So let's look at the numbers, right? So again, so saying just handle it objectively, right? Um, which is a fact, right? I mean, if you're going to cut your commission, um, you're going to need to do more to make the same amount. So either they're good with not making a fair wage, or they're not they're not uh, worth more than what they charge. I'm not saying that those agents aren't worth more than what they charge. I'm just saying that by comparison, I know that I'm charged what I'm worth. And I know my results. So I choose in a conversation like that, we're handling objection to focus on my results and their motivation and not anybody else. So, um, and you can even take a step further, but like, hey, have you met? So you've already met with them. Like how many other agents have you met with? Tell you what, why don't, why don't you meet with uh, a couple other agents? You know, you do your homework. Um, I'll go ahead and set a time to come back. I'll bring the lockbox and sign with me. Um, and I want to be the last appointment. So we'll follow up. We'll have another conversation after you talk to everybody else. We'll talk about your net sheet and you can decide what's best for you. I shattered an agent several years ago at a listing appointment. And the question came up, would you lower your commission? Because I've talked to so-and-so and they charge like, I think it was like one or I'm, I'm just going to say 1% less, yeah, lower, less. And his response, that agent's response was, if you went into work tomorrow and your boss said, I'm going to cut your pay by 10%, start effective today, what, how would you react to that? And he said, well, I wouldn't like that. I'm just repeating what I was. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and that was, you can take that strategy. Yeah, I, didn't, um, I don't know if it was the right it's a little, it puts them a little bit on the defensive. Well, that's what I was going to say. It, it was, you could see it was uncomfortable because it was like, it was almost like the agent threw that in his face. I'm not trying to say it yeah. threw it in his face that um, way, but it made, my, to me, it made the guy, I don't know if I would have said that. My general process when I'm, when I'm having these tougher conversations is. It wasn't a good listing. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ryan, but it was, I kind of got the feeling that we weren't going to get anywhere that I, I just don't think the guy was going to listen with this agent. Okay. Just because the connection that was being made was like pushing more to me, it was like that. Well, it, the reality is you can choose who your business with. So if you have, For one sure. no, I, I get that. you know, I get that. Yeah. he could have taken a route of it. Like, great. Um, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm, I really value others time and it sounds like, you know, uh, you don't want to value mine. You can walk out. I, I, I still probably wouldn't say that. It'd be too harsh. I, yeah. Because to me. I've never used it. I'm just I, saying it was kind of weird. I've never, I would never, I just would never use that. To me, it was a little too harsh. I'm my sure. focus is to not put the focus on me or not to put the focus on trying to say that they're wrong or right. Because everybody wants to look good and be right. Right. So you don't build goodwill and confidence and trust by saying, well, you're wrong. Right. You redirect, right? Same thing I do with my 14-year-old son, right? We just redirect, right? Like, hey, I want this thing. Why? Look at that. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's, that's what I do. But, oh, and, he, and then he's interested in something else, right? So, yeah, what, will you drop your commission? Let's talk about how much you're going to net, right? So I redirect. I'm not telling you you're wrong. I'm just saying, let's, let's redirect. And even by me saying, no, I won't, that's not me saying that you're wrong mm -hmm. or that comment was. And that puts people kind of puffed up and in the ego mode. And then you're trying to say, I'm not right. And I know this guy said that he would. So you're, and so you're automatically losing, losing uh, value. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that around at all. So awesome questions, uh, objections. Does that all make sense? Awesome. So let's talk about ahas from that section. What'd you guys learn? I want to hear at least three. I really like the negative positive close. Negative positive close. Okay, cool. Awesome. Like asking, like, would you or would it be okay if, or would it be a problem? I've never used that before. Awesome. Love it. Love it. Try it out. Yeah. Try just in conversation with other people. It doesn't even have to be on a point. It can be with anybody who works. 
uh, you're, you're trying to trying to get uh, your your family to to decide where to have Christmas. It's actually they could have these because <laughs> <laughs> they just stopped asking me. You show up. Okay. Other odds. I like um, when handling the objections and not so much going in and just answering their questions, but actually digging deep and handling those objections. And I feel like that kind of builds your rapport with them. Start training yourself every time you hear a question. Is, does this need to be answered or does it need to be isolated and handled? And everything in life, just start like you, when you start training your, your brain to really listen like that and be an active listener in the other person's conversation, you get really good. By the way, that's the same skill that you use when you're in coaching conversations with someone that's on your team. If any of you have 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 a, a, a desire to have people work with you. Um, anytime I have a question from a team member, I also have to decide, OK, is this a question that I need to answer as their leader or is this an objection that I need to handle as their coach? Right. As a, as a still their leader, right? Am I teaching or am I coaching? Is this a teaching moment or a coaching moment, right? And you identify that by knowing the difference. So great, thank you. What else? Other all. I really liked how you just about compensation. Just if when they ask, just say no, and then go into the question and what the real problem is. Yeah. So I guess following the objections. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Then handle. It's a very simple uh, objection handling format that you guys can follow. You isolate it and then you handle it. You isolate it, you handle it. Isolate, handle it, isolate, handle it. Meaning whatever the question is, you, you assume what it is. You say, so is it about compensation or is it about net? Okay, it's about net. Okay, it's about net. I've isolated, that's what's important. Now I handle that objection, which is how do I make sure that you make enough on your home for it to make sense for you to sell? That's not even me making sure, it's me doing my due diligence to let you know if it makes sense or not. Because if it doesn't, it doesn't. And that's not me dictating it to the market, right? Cool. Uh, let's hear another one, another aha. Oh, that's my line. Yeah, how fast can you sell my house? Oh, yeah, that's another question. I am so behind on chat. I'm so sorry. Uh, that was a great question, Andrew. <laughs> uh, what's an aha that you guys got? Somebody online. Steve, what's an aha? <laughs> Learn did your script. Did you show up? Learn your script. Learn your scripts. Okay, love it. Yeah. Learn your closes, right? We talked about all those different closes. That's great. Thank you, Steve. I wasn't fishing. Yeah, you were. I was totally fishing. If you guys don't know your scripts, guess what? You're in a room and in a class and in a brokerage full of people that are also trying to better themselves and their skills, right? So lock yourself in a room for 15 minutes a day with the same person or on the phone. It's better in person. Um, and just practice your scripts or your objections. Um, Steve and I, Steve Chilson, who's on the call, uh, and I, we did that when we first started. We went to real estate school together. We got started together. We were struggling together. Uh, we were failing together. And then we started to succeed together. And, and a lot of what we did was we started uh, script practicing together, right? We had that accountability. Um, of saying, hey, let's let's go through scripts, right? Uh, my open house script, I know like the back of my head, it's because uh, Steve and I said it back and forth, uh, I don't know how many how many hundreds of times until we actually got it down, right? So, awesome. So we have some catch up to do. I've talked a lot about um, getting to the appointment and then uh, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna get through a lot of this stuff pretty, uh, pretty quickly because some of the stuff we've already covered. I do want to hand out some stuff though. So if you guys would be kind enough to share those out. These need to be sorted and separated. There's about a seven page document. So if you want to kind of come through those and then hand them out. Yeah. And those of you that are online, I will have these copies. 
I will leave them up front um, or in the tech room, one of the two, I'll check in with Haley to see where she wants to, me to leave those. So if you guys that are out for weather, the next time you're in, you'll, you'll be able to grab them. You can also um, type your email in the chat and my admin will send that to you if you guys would rather have an emailed copy. Um, just send your, put your email on the chat um, before we finish up today, which will be in about 30 minutes or so as far as the, the presentation part. And then she can send you the documents that we're actually working on right now. And so, Seth, the two that, that I passed out is the uh, the broker metrics for the um, must supply of inventory and then the, uh, the data input form. All right. We've already talked a lot about this stuff um, in conversation, um, so I'm going to I'm going to quickly go over some of the pre-listing factor information. Um, so I I personally am very very simple when it comes to my listing process. I don't have um, I don't have a large color um, professional market. Um, a listing presentation or pre-listing presentation that I give them. However, I do um, send them a lot of things ahead of time. So my pre-listing my pre packet um, is not an actual packet. It's all digital, right? Because uh, I haven't seen them face-to-face. -face. So I typically get um, them to fill out a survey. I do a Google form. Um, and this, if you guys want to, that um, if you put in your email in the chat, we can actually um, get a generic one. I'll make a copy of the questions and I can send that to you guys later on this week if you want the Google form that I send out. But it's a very simple Google form that actually pulls up all of the information on the client. Um, so, um, and I'll, pull, I'll, I'll pull some of these resources up and share it uh, via video. So, Sesh, you can get our client questionnaire ready and queued up and uh, the broker metrics, sales price, original price queued up because I'll have you screen share here in a little bit. Um, so, Pre-selling, um, so you, the purpose of, of a, of a pre-listing packet is to basically build the confidence, answer the questions, and, and have, have those objections. My personal preference is to do this over the phone voice to voice, right? Because I don't think a packet is as effective at doing that, right? That's why we did some role play. That's why a lot of this is going to be better voice to voice. But you still can reinforce some of that by either doing a digital survey with questions that will help you identify their motivation or by giving them an actual and there's a lot of a lot of them that are in KW command designs that are already ready to go that you guys can actually personalize if you want that professional looking color, um, you know, marketing piece that you can hand them. I, I'm not against that at all. A lot of agents have a lot of success. It's a big part of their system. It's just not my style, personally. Um, it also does save you time, makes the consultation experience a little bit smoother, which is good. And then you, it allows you to state your value, telling your seller what you bring. So. Um, you send the survey, you get that back, and then you do bring them all of the things that actually make you unique, right? Which is typically like a meet the team, if it's a team document, it talks about your, your marketing um, um, process and, and, and how, many, how many sites you syndicate to, all of that stuff. Uh, and it actually uh, has a breakdown on different things that you provide. So, for example, if you were going to do, um, you know, some super special kind of uh, Walkthrough, right? Like, hey, I do Matterport walkthroughs where you can get a 3D walkthrough. You put on a VR headset and see the house in the metaverse, right? If that was your thing, right, that could be something you would want to include in it, right? Um, it, it also will let you, um, you know, reference it during your actual listing uh, presentation. If you if you're more of a paper person and you want that guide, this is a really good way to make sure that you're you're doing your listing appointment consistently every single time for you to have just a simple guideline. And mine is quite literally bullet points. It's this, 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 it's introduction, it's motivation, it's pricing, it's uh, marketing, and then it's seller's net and market observations or market the moment, right? So like literally it's just like a bullet point on a single page and it has a logo on it. Like it, 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 it is really to keep me on track uh, more than anything. And then I have some documents to support that. For example, the month supply of inventory, right? This is this is something that we'll, we'll actually get into for that. Um, like I said, you can actually do them in designs and they look really nice. You can personalize them by client name. If this is something that you want to do, great. My personal approach is make it repeatable, make it to where you don't have to prep it. I don't personalize my, my listing uh, handout to the things that I hand out. They're very much 
um, the same every single time I go, with the exception of a one-line CMA, which I do beforehand. I actually do um, a quick CMA before I go out to the property, not to establish value, but to establish my own market knowledge for their local neighborhood, if that makes sense. Um, and then I share that with them. Um, but my thought process behind that is the more time you're spending prepping, the less time you're spending actually practicing your scripture objections and having conversations with real life human beings that bring you business, right? So make sure that you're using your time wisely. Um, this stuff's really cool and it's real creative and it's not foundational and, and fundamental for you to have success in this business. Um, it's a good plus. It's not an anchoring point, in other words. So I know this is in the content, uh, but I'm going to kind of talk against it a little bit because I want to make sure that you guys are getting in conversation because that's the most important thing. To do. So seller consultation preparation checklist. Um, so if you guys have some of these items in your in your uh, guide, I think you actually have some, some resources there. So th this one's really good. The one that's actually in the guide um, covers a lot of stuff. Um, you want to read a couple of the items for the checklist for the actual seller consultation prep check checklist. Deliver your pre-listing packet on time as promised. Confirm appointment date, time, and location. Be safety and conscious. Ensure all decision makers attend. Who is involved in the selling decision? Complete and practice your listing presentation. Prepare early. Review the lead sheet. Know your seller's profile and goals. Arrive to the listing presentation in a professional manner and make a good impression. Awesome. So um, all of this stuff is a really good guideline. And this is a good checklist for you guys to make sure that your part is done. Right. Um, and a lot of this stuff, you, you notice you kind of have to identify on the phone when you set the appointment. Right. Are all the decision makers going to attend? Well, that's an expectation that you set when you set the appointment, right? So um, make sure that you, the first time you guys look at this isn't after you've already set the appointment. Otherwise, you're already going to miss a couple of things, right? So we'll do one quick aha from that section so we can stay on time. It's more important to have conversations with people than prepare your papers, your checklists. Correct. Uh, or not yeah. checklists, but your... Uh, presentation. It's more important to have conversations with people than to overly personalize your preparation. So I'll, I'll, I'll correct what I said there. So you should have this stuff, but you shouldn't spend so much time on it for every single listing appointment, because then it's a different listing appointment every single time. If you spend too much time personalizing, you should have the same things that are ready to go. I actually have folders that I can go in my office and grab. And if I get a call or a text saying, hey, come list my house, I want to meet with you at three o'clock, then I can walk upstairs, grab a folder that has some of this stuff, and then I just walk in, right? So it needs to be that systematic. Um, same with buyers. You have all your employment docs ready to go, right? And in that listing packet, you're gonna have your employment documentation. You're gonna have listing uh, a listing um, uh, market update, right? So that's what I personally use, it's not what everybody does, but we'll go over that in a second. And then you're going to have your input form. So that's what you guys have here. This is a sample input form for an actual listing that I have live in market right now. Please go show it and sell it. That would be fantastic. I would love to get an offer from one of you. <laughs> um, but I actually print one of these off um, uh, blank and I will take this through so that I, as I'm walking through the home, I can just take notes directly on it. It's a really good way to prep um, for a listing appointment as well. Awesome. So let's talk about the appointment. Goal is to get a signed listing, right? Um, and it may have sounded like I was contradictory because the goal was really to meet their motivation and make sure that they were their motivation was in line. But keep in mind that you could sign a listing agreement well before they actually do the list. You could do an authorization show, which allows you to, to, to market their property off market, uh, or you could do a longer listing um, um, agreement that has um, a, a, a clause to not share on MLS, or that has a start date that's further out. So I mean, you, could, you could be listing six months from now and go ahead and get them signed, right? Because um, that's their commitment to work with you. So um, there's lots of ways to do that. Um, you wanna create that good impression. Um, you wanna share your pricing recommendation and the initial list price for their property and your reasoning behind it. And you want to set expectations for how you will mark, market the home and work with sellers. So Seth, will you go ahead and share the list price, the sales price, uh, or excuse me, sales price to original price ratio um, form? 
Oh, did I lose Seth? Yeah, she's working on it. There we go. All right, go ahead and scroll down to the next page. All right, everybody see this? So um, when it comes to sharing your pricing recommendation, I do a one-line CMA, which I can, I, after class, I won't have time during, but after class, I can show you guys how to do that. Or if you guys ever want to come up, I can show you how to do it. It takes about five or 10 minutes. Tops. Um, I do a one-line CMA, which is where I just do a generic um, pull for the, the, the homes that are in that same subdivision or in that same school zone. Ideally, I go subdivision first. If there's not enough, I'll go elementary school zone. Um, and then I look at homes that are up and down 20% on square footage. Um, that are up and down 10 years, uh, so within a 20 year range, and then have the same bedrooms and bathrooms. Um, and just a, a very basic CMA, not to establish value, but just to establish the local market where this home is, because every market is different. And it's a way to educate me before I go into the appointment to know what homes are sold for. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. When you say 20 year range, you mean when they were built? When they were built. That's yeah. your referred reference. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so if, if my subject property is built in 1960, I'm going to pull any homes that would be with comparable bedrooms, bathrooms, and square footage from uh 1950 to 1970 for a 1960 Does that make sense? So I'm going to get 10 years up, 10 years down, because that makes a huge difference on value. And I want to make sure that I'm educated and I have that list there because then when I'm in the listing appointment, they say, well, my neighbor just sold their house for 500000 Well, it was built two years ago and yours was built in 1940. It's, that's not a comp, right? So, so sometimes you have to educate the sellers on what is and what isn't comparable for their home because they already have that idea in their head or they've looked it up on Zillow, right? Mm -hmm. So having that one-line CMA allows me to know what the actual comps are within the past three to six months within that criteria so that I can have an educated conversation about their home while I'm in their home. It's not a full CMA, right? Because I typically do a two-stage appointment where I'm gonna say, hey, let's, let's identify what, what your motivation is. Let's identify what makes sense. We can talk about your range and then we can do a final price once I, once I pull the market. I know when your timeline is. Because if I give you a price today, it's the price today. If you're not selling until six months, then this price doesn't matter whether or not you're working with me does, right? So so that, that's my personal approach. It's, to, to, it's a two-stage appointment. Ever Sean does it. Uh, I think Wes Litton still does it. There's a lot of agents that, that, that prefer a two-stage. I know Dan doesn't. He just goes straight to the one stage. Um, so some of that depends on your volume. I think two-stage makes a lot of sense um, um, for certain clients and not a lot of sense for others. It just depends. So um, this is the other thing that I bring up. Can you, can you zoom it up just a little bit? And then kind of shift it to the right or to the left. Yeah, there we go. So this is the other thing I bring on the listing appointment. And this is in every single listing appointment. I bring this up. Um, this is the average sales price to original price ratio. So, and I'm going to explain it to you guys the same way I do to sellers, right? And you guys have this. You can take notes on it if you have it in front of you, or you guys can take notes at home. Um, this chart this graph or this this uh this column these columns this shows the rep uh the the uh, relationship between where homes started so what was their initial listing price and where homes ended so where did they actually sell for it's different than a list price to sales price ratio because list price to sales price shows you what price was the home listed at when it procured the offer to sell at that price this is where they started do you guys see the difference? Awesome. So there is no difference if there's no price changes. So this first column, you can see for the whole year back, um, we have an average sales price, original price right now, as of the end of December, of 98.4%. And an average days on market for homes that, that are in that category of 11 days. So what that means is, and we can do some math here. Somebody give me a uh, price for a home. 350,000. 350,000. Okay. Let's just say that that's our range, right? So what's 350,000 times 98.4%? Uh, I'm not going to do math. You guys have to do it. She's got it. Okay. 
Okay, so Mr. and Mrs. Seller, assuming your price, is, your home is in this price range and it's priced correctly, meaning you don't have to have any price changes. On average, you could you could expect to make about three hundred forty-four thousand four hundred dollars um, if you're if you're following this trend, right? If we price it right the first. Now, the second category means that they missed on price. We had to have one or more price changes to actually sell, and. That percentage is 89.7%. And what do you guys notice about the average days on market? Longer. How much longer? Almost five times. Like almost five times longer. Yeah. Like you're talking uh, within a couple of weeks or within a couple of months. That's a big difference, right? That's a big difference, especially if you have already identified that your seller is more motivated by time, right? So again, I'm tying this this metric, this market data, this standard form that we get every month into the motivation of the client to understand where we need to agree to price their home to get what they want. So I don't come in with a pricing recommendation. I come in with a pricing range on what the market will allow, which is a little different than some listing agents. And then where they price within that range is 100% up to their motivation. Um, and there is a price that is so high that I will not take the listing because I only take listings that I believe that I can sell based on where their motivations are, right? That's how I do it personally. And this helps me have a barometer for where that is. Will you still take a listing if your client understands that range and if they're willing to come down or is it a waste of, obviously it's a waste of time taking it too high because you don't want to, it's not gonna sell. It depends on the motivation. That's what I was gonna say, yeah. depending on the motivation. It, so too high is relative, too high based on what? On what? No, I'm just saying. If it's too high based same. on their motivation, then right. I won't take the listing, whether it's too high or not. Okay. Does okay. it make sense? Now you made it clear. It, it all comes down to their motivation. Right. If okay. it's so high that I think that they're out of the realm of possibility, and I as an agent feel don't feel like putting my reputation on the line and taking a listing that will not sell, right. then I say, hey, I'm not the agent for you. Or we can talk through the data and try and get to a position where I, I believe that we could come to an agreement. But if we don't agree on where we're going to price your home to sell it, then I'm not your agent. And it's nothing personal. I still really hope that you take all of this to heart because I really want to help you. And I can't help you if you're not working within the market that we're given. I don't set it. You don't set it. Buy or set the market. I could always revisit with you in a couple months. If that number is what's most important to you, then maybe this just isn't the time for you to sell. And I can revisit it in a couple of months and we can check in and see where your equity is then. All right, we've had those conversations too. You still keep the relationship, right? Set your follow-up appointment. So um, so let, let's let's do the difference. So what's 350 times uh, 89.7? 313,950. 313,950. So big difference, but I'm not going to do the difference there. I'm going to take this one step further. Let's say the price range for the home is actually between 340 and about three, uh, 360. Those are, that's really the high end and the low end of the range, the value range. So let's do 340 times 98.4. So 334,560? Yeah. 560. Okay, so that's, let's say we priced it aggressively. We were on the lower end of the range. We made sure that we we were in that first category and that's what we're looking to do. Um, now let's times 360. We say, hey, you know what? You know what, Brian, price really is the most important to us, not time. We don't care if we're on the market for a couple of days. Um, let's price it to the height of the market. Let's start it at 360 and we can always come down, but we can never come up, um, which is not actually true, but that's okay. I'll, for the for the purpose of the math, we'll still assume that's true. So what's 360,000 times 89.7? 322,920. 920. What's the difference between the two of those?
close to 12 grand. $11,640. I love allowing data to make my points because then I'm not selling them, right? So, hey, I know, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I know that you're wanting to really maximize what you want, and we can absolutely price it to the top of the market. Statistically speaking, where our market's right now, that would put you netting almost 12,000 less. And by the way, you would have a couple additional payments for your mortgage in there too, where you're paying interest on it, because it's gonna take us a couple of months to get a buyer for your home. Um, or you could actually price it more aggressively and competitively, which again, from our NAR surveys, a lot of sellers want about 20%, right, or so. So, um, and then we can actually net you more by starting in a more competitive place within the market. So would you rather sell for more money in less time and make more money? Or would you rather make less and take longer to get there? It's really, I know it, that, that is a, it's a totally leading question, right? Because the reality is marketing it competitively is always the right choice. It really is. But again, you gain their motivation so that you know how to approach this conversation. And then this is this is the nail in the coffin, so to speak. That's my NBA jam speak. This is the hey, we're gonna we're, this is the Hail Mary, right? This is the this is the form that I bring at the end of the consultation to make sure that they understand, hey, we're gonna commit to pricing within the market competitively. And this is how we do that. Um, and um, we're gonna balance this with a seller's net sheet to let them know what they're what they're actually going to make. So, um, Seth, will you pull up the spreadsheet, uh, the seller's the seller's net sheet for us? Awesome, cool. So, this is an example of a seller's net sheet. Go ahead and put in our prices. Go ahead and put low three forty, median three fifty, and high three sixty. If you guys want a copy of this, it's very, very simple formulaic spreadsheet. Again, if you guys can, um, you know, make sure your email's in the chat, then we can email this to you guys. Uh, we'll email you a, a, a version that you can actually copy. Um, so let's assume that the total liens what the seller owes on this property is 240,000. That's what, that's where that uh, number two comes from. <clears throat> Um, we already have the realtor commission being calculated for them so that we don't have to talk about commission. We can just focus on what their net is, right? It's very intentional. Um, and then we have our transaction fee, which I charge um, to all my clients as, a, as, as part of part of our, our employment agreement. We have an estimated closing costs, which I put in as a blanket thousand. I can vary that if I already get a quote ahead of time, which you can. You can go through and get a quote from a lot of title companies on what estimated closing costs would be to sellers. Um, but just keep in mind that they're also going to be giving a credit to the buyer for prorating taxes. So the later in the year, the higher their potential closing costs. Um, and then we get into buyer's closing costs if paid by the seller, which right now we have as a thousand. Let's just assume that they're, uh, you know, it's it's a little bit cooler market. We can expect the buyer to ask for closing costs. Let's go ahead and put in five thousand for buyer's closing costs. So let's let's say we're, we're we're expecting to get offers where buyers are asking for the sellers to pay for their closing costs. In other words, um, so we'll put five thousand across the board there on all three of those columns, if you would, Seth. And then let's say they, they actually have some repair work that needs to be done. Um, we can put that in there too. Um, or um, we can estimate uh, based on uh, the listing, which is what I do. So, uh, and you don't have to change that. So that's, we, we, we have that already form, form, uh, a formula for it. So we do it as 1% of the sales price. That's a good general rule. I'm actually probably about to bump that up to 2% just so that I set the proper expectations because um, uh, we're, we're seeing more um, more repairs negotiated successfully in, in deals now than we used to. Um, but again, we're going to estimate for um, inspections and repairs that the buyer's going to ask for some of that stuff. And then, then we have the net. So the difference that we're talking about is 69850 if we sell and close at 340 uh, versus the 8950 if we sell and close at 360. Um, but again, I'm able to give them the low, median, high. And I'm on the pessimistic. So I go through the chart. I say, hey, you're probably going to net more, right? The market is dictating that if we price aggressively and competitively. And even if we don't, even if we just get what we're asking and we're at the bottom of 
of the uh, of the market for, and we're just really aggressive, beating out our competition. The sixty nine thousand eight hundred and fifty allow you to walk away with what you need to walk away with, and then we come back to that commission conversation if they had it or not, right? So remind me again what you needed to do, why you were selling, you know, where where are we going, what do we need to get there? Well, we want to upgrade or we want to downsize, whatever. How much money do we need to get there, right? And this gives us a formula for that. Yes, you guys with me? Cool. Is that making sense online? Is that making sense to everybody? Yeah. Wait. Love it. All right. So, um, any questions about the seller's net sheet before I swap back over to the actual um, presentation? I have a question. Yeah. So, you do um, all those numbers for them and you let them choose which one they prefer or do you just give them like i recommend for us to price the house um for three fifty thousand, or do you let them make the decision I, I i show them the other comps um i actually usually have my laptop and we'll look at the houses together and so if i don't want to do a two-step or if their motivation is quicker i'll do the second appointment in one which is where i do the cma with them sitting right there next to you I'll pull everything up. We'll actually look at it together. We'll look at the comparable homes. I'll allow them to say, hey, is that superior or inferior to your home? And then we can have a decision about where we need to price it competitively to get what they want. And I ask them that directly. So, you know, I've given you the data. I take a consultative approach, not a sales approach. I'm here as your coach. I'm here to coach you through this transaction, through this life transition, through this sale. Um, where do you believe we need to price, given the information I've, I've given you and looking at the other competition? Where do you think we need to price your home to get you what you want? And I let them answer. And if it's within a range that I believe I can sell, um, then we're good. We take the listing, right? If it's outside of the range, right, and it's not in the competitive side of the range, right, then I just have a conversation and I revisit it. Said it's okay. So I just want to make sure that I'm clear because you, you said your motivation was this. Let's regage. So if we do this, if we do price at the top of the market, you understand the risk. Yes. Okay, cool. So this is a listing uh, change amendment. And I want to go ahead and have you pre-sign this, stating that, that if in two weeks, which by the way, that's a little bit more time, our average is 11 days, if it's priced correctly, we'll know, right? Because we'll have an offer. But in two weeks, if we don't achieve that price, then we're going to do a price improvement. We're going to we're going to we're going to get it where we need to 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 price it to get you the offer that you need to get you where you want, right? So I get that pre-commitment to a price change at the appointment. They sign it. We 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 agree to it. We leave the price blank because that's something that we can cover over the phone, right? Um, and then um, two weeks down the road, if we don't have the showing activity that we need, guess what? We're doing a price change. Does that make sense? So did that answer your question? Yeah. Your question. Okay. Other other questions about seller's net sheet or boot. Keep on rolling. Cool. All right. Awesome. So let's switch back. And share screen. All right. Let's see here. Let's skip the quote. I'm going to get on because we are at time and I do not want to cut into your lead gen time. We've already talked about opportunities and stages, right? I actually pulled that up. We did a screen share so you guys could see how I actually set up my cultivate pipe, pipeline. Listing walkthrough um, is, is going to be pretty straightforward, right? You're walking through and um, just using this as a checklist. This is the actual input form, the one that I handed out that you guys will be using to input it into the MLS. So it's no, it's really easy to keep apples to apples there. You don't have to convert a notebook or or go from memory. Well, was that a gas furnace or was it electric? Was that a was was that a freestanding stove or did they have a garbage disposal? I don't actually remember if they have a garbage disposal, right? So if you take the time to actually walk through and and do this as a checklist, then you'll be prepared. Um, another option is you can have the sellers do that. So you can leave that for their homework, right? You give them a blank one for them to fill out and sign, and then you can either pick it up or have them email it to it, or you can do it digitally. Either way is fine. We just want to make sure that um, that they uh, they are, are confident, you're confident that everything that you're syndicating to MLS is what's actually there in the house. You don't want to get a fine and you don't want to misrepresent the home. Okay. 
Um, and then you do a handwritten note, right? So you guys are talking about your handwritten notes already. You guys have been doing that. So um, um, every single appointment, whether you take it or not, even if they spit in your face and say, I'm only using you if you drop your commission down to 1%, you send them a thank you note because um, there is always something to be grateful for. Um, even if it's saying, hey, I really appreciate your time. I know that time is, is, uh, is a very valuable thing that we don't give back. So um, thank you for spending your time to just to know whether or not I was a good fit for you to work with or not. Even if they don't use you, that's a gesture that'll, that'll land. And then they may have uh, some more difficult conversations with some other agents and then come back to you. And you can choose if you actually want to work with them or not. Always do a handwritten note. So um, let's in the agreement. Okay. Agreement's pretty straightforward. Um, and we have a lot of services that'll help with this too. You know, Onward is, is there to actually help with understanding some of these agreements and do some prep work for you, or a lot of uh, agents or teams use transaction coordinators. You can also do it yourself, but I cannot stress enough, go to the contract classes. You need to understand the forms that you are signing and your clients are signing. Um, I went in my first year to six different contract classes just on employment forms, including a couple that were with attorneys from the state, because it's that important to understand these legal documents. So if you don't have a good grasp on that, um, get a grasp on it. I'm not saying don't go, do, go, do, go uh, you know, talk to people, have appointments, right? Because you'll learn through that, but make sure that you're taking the time to educate yourself on those forms. Um, that's, that's the huge. All right, ahas from today. Uh, let's revisit. So do we talk about what to bring to a listing appointment? You guys feel like we, we got that? Okay, cool. I'll make sure that this is my report card. So I'm making sure I did good. Uh, do we talk about handling objections? Yeah, we even handled a couple in class, love it. Do we talk about some unique items of value? Right, what were some examples of unique items of value? Time. Time? Yeah, making, I guess, um, finding out what their motivation is and, and time and showing them how you can meet that expectation. Cool, yeah. Um, I, I talked a little bit about what my unique value is, right? Where I actually offer a higher percentage listing with more services, right? So the 7% listing, that'd be an economy of value. Something on social media would be unique. You know, if you guys look at any of my listings or if you guys look at my uh, Facebook page, it's Brian Stone Dash Realtor, you will see probably 50, 60 different videos um, on my page, on my business page. And you can, and there's a playlist called listing videos. You can see every single listing video is professionally shot, no matter the price. That's again, me saying, Hey, I don't care what the listing price is. When you work with me, you get a luxury product. You get a luxury level of service, whether or not you're a million dollar homeowner or not, we're still going to treat you like you are. You get drone, you get all the stuff, right? So that's just, I, so, it, and put another way, Again, this is my unique item of value that I present. I said, I would rather spend my more of my money than other agents so that you can walk away with more of your money. Doesn't that make sense? And then I end it with a timeout, right? Very effective. So um, CMA before or after, right? So we talked about a one-line CMA and then a full CMA either during or after. So, um, and then lead conversion. You guys feel a little bit better on lead conversion with some of those Closing tactics and some of the uh, the different closes, negative, positive, stuff like that. Cool. How we do? Great. Great. Awesome. Fantastic. Love to hear it. Um, let's see. Let me see. Any, any more ahas on the chat? No. So, um, so I really like. I'm not going to go all the way through the for, through this format because we're a little bit uh, later on time. But how has you? I do like the first one. How has your thinking changed? And what ideas or mindsets were new for today? For me, it's more like not just answering the questions because whenever I get a question, I just feel like I need to answer them and answer them with like the right answer. Uh, but it's more about like having a two-way conversation, not just like answering and that's it. You know, like just keep asking questions to each other until we get to like the, the actual motive of why they're asking. Love that, love that. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that. So that's a great, that's a great way to change your thinking. Um, let's, let's hear one more. How has your thinking changed? And what ideas or mindsets were new? And it should be, you guys online, you can, you can chat, or you, can, you can unmute yourself and, 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 uh, and talk either way.
And that doesn't mean it can't be one of you guys too, if you want to chime in. I, I agree with the poll. What does my thinking of handling objections? The, yeah, the questions versus objections section. Yeah, love it. Um, awesome. So daily success system. So uh, I assume you guys go over this at the end of every every session, right? Somewhat. Somewhat. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's pretty basic. Ten conversations, ten contacts added, ten handwritten notes, the ten five one in social media engagement. And then um, all of those things that that lead you to the actual close. Um, make sure you're doing the do not call list. I know we have to put this in every time. Um, I will say that uh, we used to call it the daily 10-4 for Ignite. I've done Ignite three times. And the agents that actually went through Ignite and did the activities um, and were there the whole time, I am still in business with, right? They are still in our office or they are in our industry. Um, the ones that did not are not. So make sure that you guys are doing these activities. It seems really simple, but there is a monotony to success. Um, agents in this office sell hundreds of homes. We, we're, we're, very, we're very fortunate to have some really effective, high-producing leaders and, and producers in this office. Um, you know, Adam Grady, Dan Hall, Jen Davis, Carrie Warsh, you know, even some fantastic, uh, uh, you know, individual agents like Paulina, um, you know, uh, Brian Fisher. There's, there's so many good agents. And I will tell you that if you talk to all of them, there's something that they do that is very monotonous that actually is the, the one thing that leads to their success. It is boring to make a lot of money in real estate. It really is because you have to figure out the things that you do well and that you need to do to turn that lever on and you just have to consistently do them every single day. That doesn't mean they can't be fun, but it does mean you have to be consistent. So make sure that you guys are starting those habits here by having your conversations, doing your handwritten notes. It really is that important. It really is. Awesome. I'll step off my soapbox. box. All right. Um, and then someone read this, this quote for me. I engage every conversation in the spirit of contribution and people are happy to be in a relationship with me. Yeah, that is a that is an example of a positive affirmation. It's purposeful, it's it's present tense. And uh, if you need to hype yourself up before a listing appointment or before a, a pre-listing conversation, this is this is something that you guys can go back to. Because if your focus is this, I guarantee you'll have success with listings in this industry. If your focus is engaging every single conversation in the spirit of contribution, um, then you will identify those motivating factors that sellers need you to know so that you can do the best service possible for them, right? And if, if people are happy to be in a relationship with you, then they will be happy to refer you to other people. And that's how you can leverage those listings to get more business. I'm not just buyer leads that come in off the signs, but also treating the relationship correctly so that you can help them time and time and time again. I have three different generations in three different families that are in my database right now. I, I don't sell the most real estate. I don't sell the least in this office, but I can tell you that I have some really loyal fans that because I, I value them above any kind of commission, whether I get one, I help mom, dad, granddad, sister, sons, daughters, grandsons. I get the whole generation. And that is really, really rewarding. Um, I could tell you that um, it's, a, it's a phenomenal business to be in. You can start to see people have kids, those kids grow up, and then to help those kids find their home. That's like, that makes you feel all kinds of warm and fuzzy when you can see multi-generational movement towards homeownership because you know that you're bettering that whole family and future generations by making sure that they have a stable house to live in and that they are in a stable financial position where they're building their own equity instead of somebody else's. It's really cool what we get to do every day. So make sure you guys don't take that for granted. Is that fair? Very fair. Awesome. Like my tie down at the end? Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. So we're going to get into um, the last couple of minutes. This is all of our um, systems, which usually Shanna comes down for this, I think, right? So um, we will we'll break for the learning. I'll, uh, I'll stick around for a couple of minutes. So if you guys have any questions, otherwise, we'll, we'll jump right into the, uh, the actual lead generation um, activity content. Have you guys been on, online? Have you guys been staying on Zoom? for these portions for the past couple of days with weather or have they kept the Zoom open for you guys to do or are you just doing your lead generation activities on your own? Does anybody know? Just on our own. On your own? Okay, cool. 
So, um, so I'll, I'll stick around here for those that are in person and if anybody online, if you have any questions, you can let me know, but um, otherwise you guys are free to jump off. Um, we'll go ahead and stop the recording. And if you guys need any information from me, um, Seth, will you go ahead and put my details in the chat, uh, name, phone number, and email? Um, if you guys ever need anything, um, I, I, my door is always open unless it's not. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, if there's a sign on it that says I'm doing my one thing, that means that I'm time blocking and I'm putting my clients first. Otherwise, um, you can either set an appointment with me when I'm not doing that, or if my door's open, you can just walk right in. I'm happy to help you guys with anything you need. Okay. Did you reach out for coaching at all after yeah. a certain time? Like, say, your first, I'm just curious. Yeah. Um, uh, so we'll, I, I'll, I can answer that question, but I'm going to go ahead and stop the, the Zoom so we can uh, wrap up. But yeah, I, I was a coach. Um, about a year and a half for our office until um, Shanna took over this past year. But yourself, when you started in business, um, did you like you were your own rainmaker? 